Hello, Dallas First Assembly. How's everybody doing today? Good. Yeah, that's a good response right there. Everybody awake. Nice. If y'all could just uh, stand with me today, raise your hand as we give reverence to our Lord. Lord God, we, we just praise you and worship you today, Lord. We thank you. We thank you and give you honor, Lord, that you can just bring us here today as one body so that we can, we can exalt to you, Lord. Lord, that we can bring you your reverence. Lord, that we give you all of the glory and honor today, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.
days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God So, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been Oh 
direct your faith, direct your prayer. Let's believe God together. In Jesus' name, we come right now. For there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power over sickness. There is power over disease. There is power over every demonic force, every spirit of darkness. Lord, in Jesus' name right now, we declare that you are Lord over us and over our lives and over our situations. God, right now, we join our faith together with the fellowship here of the redeemed. We join our faith together believing for the hand of the Lord to come mightily upon those that are sick. We pray for Jean and Dorothy Jeffrey as a point of contact for as we pray and lift up all those right now who find themselves in peril of health and find themselves sick unto death, God, that you would stretch forth your hand and have mercy upon them and the power of Jesus would flow mightily, Lord God, upon them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Quicken, quicken their bodies, we pray right now. Lord, we pray for comfort and strength. We pray the peace of the Holy Spirit will fill the hearts and minds of Sherry Moseson and her family, of John Jackson as his family, and Mitchell White and his family. God, these are hard times. These are uh, times that try us, but Lord, uh, there is nothing impossible for you. You said to cast all our cares upon you, for you care about us. So today, Lord Jesus, we bring our needs before you, and we pray in the mighty name of the Lord that you would undertake on behalf. Lord, we pray for these families, those who have stepped out in the aisle. That's their step of faith, God. That's the faith that it took uh, to step out into the aisle and believe you and stand in that place declaring their dependence, their need uh, for you, Lord God. We pray right now from the left to the right, front to the back upon each person that has uh, made an expression, that has communicated to us in this way. Lord, we join our faith together right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we're believing for victory. We're believing for breakthrough. We're believing for the supernatural power of God to come upon these lives and situations. You are still a prayer answering, mountain moving, miracle working, mind, body, and soul healing God. So Lord Jesus, today we look unto you, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we pray and believe. We pray and believe together that God, you will show yourself mighty in these lives and situations. Be merciful unto us, O oh God. Let your grace, let your mercy be our portion today. Jesus, Jesus, powerful name. Amen, amen, amen. Can you give the Lord an offering of celebration and thanksgiving? And by faith, by faith today, thank you for the miracle. Thank you for the answer. Thank you for the healing. Amen. Rejoice and be glad in the Lord. Amen. Well, before you're seated, why don't you turn around and greet one another, welcome each other here, look them in the eye, let them know you're glad they're here, let them know that uh, we're not alone, God is with us, amen. Praise the Lord, and as you do, you may be seated once again. Thank you for that wonderful time of worship, and thank you for your presence here today, being here on this Sunday. Let me tell you something, I remember hearing the old preachers say, Back when I was a kid, they would say, I'd rather be in God's house. Some of you know where that's going. You heard it too. I'd rather be in God's house than the best hospital in town. I'd rather be in God's house than the best jail in town. Well, friends, I'd rather be just about anywhere than the best hospital and the best jail in town. But I'd rather be in God's house than Disneyland. I'd rather be in God's house than the White House. Amen. I'd rather be in God's house than at Buckingham Palace. Amen. There's no better place to be than in the house of the Lord with God's people. And let me tell you, this is the safest place to be. This is the safest place to be because the safest place is in the will of God. The safest place is in the presence of God. And so you're in a safe place today. You've chosen wisely to come and worship the Lord together. I want to make you aware that Wednesday night we do have adult Bible study in the sanctuary and it is very safe. Plenty of room for you to spread out, sprawl out, just have, take a whole row for yourself, take a whole three, four rows for yourself and come and be with us. But if you're not able to or, or don't feel that that would be the wisest thing for you to do, we understand that. 
and we would encourage you to follow us online. We are, we're doing our best to keep our services on live, live stream. In fact, we're live streaming right now, so could you greet those that are watching us right now? There'll be many at home right now, all over the place, watching us. Somebody asked the other day, is anybody in the church? Because <laughs> I was up here preaching away and they thought maybe I was in here by myself. But uh, there are people here. There's, like I said on Wednesday night, I kind of feel like the old television programs they used to say. Remember, this program was filmed before a live studio audience. You are the live studio audience this morning that we are uh, bringing this uh, message to everyone. So we want to encourage you. Also want to make you be mindful that uh, this week we hope to get some information out. The work of the church cannot stop. The work of the church must go on. The, the Great Commission has not been put on pause. We have to continue to make disciples. We have to continue to preach and teach. And we're just going to have to find another. The devil's never been able to stop the church. I said the devil's never been able to stop the church. I mean, in the first century, they tried to stop the church and they couldn't. And they have tried to stop the church in Muslim countries and communist countries and Cuba and China and Viet everywhere. And they cannot stop the church. The church will not be stopped. Amen. Amen. So if communism couldn't stop us, this coronavirus is going to stop us. We are going to find a way to continue to do what God called us to do. We'll be wise about it, but we're going to keep doing what God called us to do. So we are preaching, we are teaching, and so we have a new ministry that we'll be launching here very, very quickly that we think will be a great benefit to everybody. And so be listening and looking on your emails, and we hope to get that information out to you quickly because we have got work to do, and we cannot we cannot uh, take uh, a year off because souls lie in the balance. Amen. Just that's one reminder. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to read verse 1 through 8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. And the impetus for this message, the motivation for which I bring this message is I want to help us all understand the identity of the church and the role of the church in these last days. How many believes we're living in the last days? How many believe that? A few of you. I said, how many believe we're living in the last days? You know, it's amazing. A lot of the things that we heard were going to happen in the last days. I remember as a child thinking, oh, that's impossible. That kind of stuff couldn't happen. Well, friends, all bets are off, to use a, <laughs> a bad expression. Uh, I can see where any of anything is possible now, that our world can overnight be turned upside down, and things can happen so drastically, so dramatically, and so swiftly that I don't have any trouble whatsoever believing that the, uh, that the entire world system as we know it could just collapse and this world plunge into utter chaos, and we are seeing it. But what's, what is the identity of the church, and what is the role of the church in these last days? That's important for us to know, because if we listen to the world we will get an inferiority complex. And I think the church in America today is living with an inferiority complex because we have been told over and over and over again that Christianity, that the church is in decline in America. And that may be true numerically and statistically and everywhere else. And that may be what the statistics and the st statisticians tell us. But what does God say about his church? And what does God say about the role of the church in these last days? And when we begin to see ourselves as God sees us, and we begin to occupy the role in this end time drama that God has given to the church, friends, we're going to see things change and things happen that we would not think otherwise possible if we only look to the eyes of the flesh. So we got to put our faith glasses on this morning. I said, we got to put our faith glasses on this morning. You know, sometimes when that poor old guy was half blind and he saw a girl and he thought she was really beautiful, and then he put his glasses on. <laughs> well, we're the opposite. We take our faith glasses off, we see the church, we think, oh, that's terrible. That's, look at the church, is just a mess. The church is just. But when we put our faith glasses on, we see the church in all the glow, clothed in the glory and the splendor and the power of God. Amen. We don't see some decrepit, 
diminished, declining old thing. We see a church that is brilliant. We see a church. You got to put your faith glasses on to see it, though, sometimes. But we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 8 says this. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. This is not just generalized apostasy, but a very, the apostasy, there was a a specific apostasy. And the man of lawlessness, a specific man, is revealed the son of destruction or the son of perdition. Who opposes, this man of lawlessness does, and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? So this, this is something that P- Paul had already told the Thessalonians in person was he was with them. But somebody came in and began to perturb them. Somebody began to disturb them and, and cause them to become fearful or anxious. And so he has to send them a reminder and says, don't you remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you all these things. And you know, and you know What restrains him now? Now, the problem is we don't know. They knew because Paul had told them in person. But unfortunately for us, he doesn't. He says, and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed, this man of lawlessness. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, listen to this, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So today I want to talk to you about the church, the end time church, who we are and what role we play in this end time drama. And the role we play in this end time drama is not later, but it's the role we occupy right now. What is the church supposed to be doing right now? Now, the Bible speaks of the coming of the Lord. He speaks of the day of the Lord. We use words like the second coming. We use words like the end times. We talk about the rapture of the church. And it's very easy for us to kind of lump all those things together and erroneously conclude that they're all one and of the same. But the coming of the Lord and the rapture of the church are actually two different events. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute here. I thought it was all one, and it was just one big thing. You know, I'm from Arizona. In Arizona, we have mountains. Now, here in Texas, I'm told everything is bigger in Texas, not the mountains. The mountains are bigger out west. And I grew up in a valley in the shadow of a beautiful mountain range, beautiful mountain range. And... In the winter, of course, it'd be snow covered up there, that mountain range. Beautiful, beautiful. In fact, when I was a child, my uncle would take us up into that mount, up to those mountains. He knew one of the ranchers up there who had a lot of acreage, and he would give us permission to chop down a Christmas tree. So we would go up there, and we would pick out our Christmas tree and chop it down and haul it down the mountain. Beautiful. But from where we stood... Many, many miles from those mountain ranges, it appears as if all of those mountains are one. But when you get to the first mountain, you discover that there are miles between one mountain and the other. And that is the way many times it is when we look at the panorama of eschatology, when we look at the panorama of end time events. We are far from it and we are looking towards it and the Bible, even the Bible writers were and they see one big panorama but uh, that does not mean that they are all one event. And many times there are, there's a distance between one event and the other and so when we say, well, isn't the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't the end of time, isn't the uh, the rapture of the church, isn't it all one, one, one event, not precisely. 
Often the Bible re uh, references, to s references several events that compose a single event. Let me explain. We talk about we're saved because of the work of Christ at Calvary. We talk about the cross. But when we talk about the cross, we're not just talking about the cross. When we preach the gospel and we tell people that we are saved because of the cross, we're really talking not about that one event isolated to those three hours on that day. We're talking about his suffering beginning even at, 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 at uh, Gethsemane. We're talking about his suffering at the whipping post. We're talking about when he carried the cross up to Mount Calvary. We're talking about when they nailed his hands and his feet in the crown of thorns. We're talking about when he died. But we're also talking about when he was buried. And how many knows that when we preach the cross, you cannot adequately preach the cross without also proclaiming that the same Jesus who died and was buried is the same Jesus who was raised to life everlasting and he's alive forevermore, the resurrection. But we talk about it as the cross. And so many times the Bible and many times in these things we're talking about an event, but it's really a series of events. The day of the Lord, the second coming, become overarching titles for a series of cataclysmic events. That uh, The Greek is the parousia. These things that will happen, and I would tell you today, are happening. And many people get confused with eschatology because they don't pay attention to the difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. I want to share with you just a minute about that because the first verse of chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, Now re request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. And that gathering together to him is like a hen gathering her chicks underneath her wings to brood over them. And that's the, the, the Lord bringing his people under his covering. Many people get confused with these two things. The, the return of the Lord is imminent. It could happen this very hour. How many believe that? That the Bible teaches that uh, the return of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord could happen this very hour. We believe that. The early church, including the Apostle Paul, believed that. But you will notice that the passage we read states that certain things have to happen that have not yet happened before the day of the Lord comes. We'll look at some of those in just a minute, but first I want to talk to you about this gathering together. It's a word, the, the Greek word there for the gathering together in verse 1. Our gathering together, it's a word that is only used one other time in the New Testament, and that's in Hebrews 10.25 when it says to not forsake the gathering together or the assembling of the saints together. Do not forsake the assembling together. This foreshadows this gathering right here, foreshadows shadows the gathering together of all believers when Christ shall round them up from the four corners of the earth so that together we might worship Jesus in community and in communion. Isn't it a wonderful thought that this gathering is a foreshadowing of the gathering that we will have that day when Jesus gathers all of his church to him and that is the word that is used. We're talking about this gathering together that the Apostle Paul describes so clearly in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, or ignorant about those who are asleep. They were worried about those who had died because the church in its infancy and its ignorance thought that maybe those who died were going to miss out on the return of Christ because they weren't alive to see it and they had lost hope. But the Apostle Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose, in other words, not even death can keep you from entering the loving embrace of Jesus when he gathers his people to himself. One day he's going to come and round them all up. 
and even death itself is not going to be able to hold you. The grave is not going to be able to hold you from the call of Jesus and the, the summons of the Spirit when he calls his people unto himself to be with him. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, and that means to remain in Christ, not just that you remain alive, but those who remain in Christ until the coming of the Lord will not proceed those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice, every time we shout, that's a reminder, friends, that one day there's going to be a shout from heaven. And the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together. That's that gathering together. With him in the clouds, listen very closely to the words, to meet the Lord, where? In the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In the rapture, Jesus comes for his church. At the second coming, Jesus returns to earth with his church. In the rapture, Jesus meets his church in the air. But at the second coming, the Bible tells us that his foot will strike the Mount of Olives. I've been to the very pinnacle of the Mount of Olives. And I could just imagine there across the Kidron Valley east of Jerusalem. And I saw the place where Jesus is going to put his foot. When he, the Bible says that when his foot strikes the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives is going to be ripped in two. But when the rapture, he meets the church in the air. In the second coming, he comes with his church and his foot strikes the Mount of Olives. In the rapture, only the dead in Christ will be raised for recompense. At the second coming, all the dead will be raised for judgment. In the rapture, only his church will see him. But at the second coming, the Bible tells us that every eye shall behold him. The rapture can happen at any moment. But the second coming, listen very closely, cannot happen until certain things happen first. And that's what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, don't let anybody tell you that the second coming has already happened or that it's happening right now because these things have to happen before the second coming. Not before the rapture, but before the second coming. Some believe in no rapture at all, claiming that the church is already experiencing great tribulation. They point to the suffering of believers in other countries. But the great tribulation will not be regional or local. It will be worldwide. No doubt there's great suffering today. And in many places, the church is suffering tribulation. That is great. But without minimizing the suffering that others are experiencing, we can say this with all certainty, that that is nothing compared to the suffering that the Bible describes during that seven-year period known as the great tribulation. You think things are bad now. Just you wait and see. If the world thinks things are bad now, if people think things are bad now, there's, it has no comparison These, the, the, what will happen. Others believe in the rapture at the end or the middle of the great tribulation. I don't believe that. And I'll share with you in just a moment why I don't. Now, we don't want to be arrogant about that. We always want to approach the word of God with humility and recognize that there's limitations to what we know. God doesn't tell us everything we want to know. He tells us everything we need to know. We know we, he gives us all the information we need to be able to live for him and be saved and inherit eternal life. He doesn't answer all of our curiosities and all of our wonderings and all of the things we'd like to know. So we understand that and we approach it with a degree of humility as we should. But I believe that, uh, the, that God will uh, gather together his people before the tribulation. And I believe that biblically. Here's why. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1 says, Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord, there's that overarching expression, the parousia will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly. 
like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape but you but they will not escape but you brethren are not in darkness that the light should that the day should overtake you like a thief for you are all sons of light and sons of day we are not of night or of darkness so then let us not sleep as others do but let us be alert and sober for those who sleep do their sleeping at night those who get drunk get drunk at night but since we are of the day let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation verse 9 how beautiful for God has not destined us for wrath can you say praise the Lord. God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as also you are doing. The wrath of God that will be poured out upon an unbelieving and a wicked world during that seven-year period of great tribulation that you can read about over in Revelation beginning chapter 4 and onwards as they be as Jesus himself begins to break the seals of the scroll remember we talked about that some week ago and every time he breaks one of those seals there's a release of judgment and then he breaks another seal and here comes another judgment and he has seven seals to break but here's the thing on the seventh seal he breaks the seventh seal and then there's seven judgments in the seventh seal so it is a, a myriad of judgments that will be poured out upon planet Earth that will happen during that seven-year period. Others, uh, and so, but we, friends, but we have not been destined for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That judgment, that wrath is reserved for those who have rejected the free offer of salvation through Jesus Christ for a wicked and unbelieving world. That is what has been reserved for them, but friends, not for us. The passage we read in 2 Thessalonians 2 reveals several important truths concerning the coming of the Lord. That is that the coming of the Lord is distinct from the rapture of the church. That the coming of the Lord requires that certain things happen first. Now we request, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord and our gathering together of him, that you not be quickly shaken. And it says this, let, it says this, for it will not come, the coming of the Lord, unless these things happen first. What are they? Number one, the apostasy. Let no one deceive you. The day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Now, what does apostasy mean? It means a falling away. So when the Bible speaks of a great falling away, and there are people who have rejected, turned their back on Christ, or who have renounced Christ, or have fallen away from the faith, there's always been throughout the 2,000 years of church history, there have always been people. But the Bible here indicates that there will be a great falling away, a great apostasy. Look around. Look around. Because the Bible says one of the things that will happen is that many who once knew him will turn their backs on him. Many who once served him will renounce him. Many who once believed will no longer believe. There will be an apostasy, a great falling away. And you say, oh, we're already seeing it. No, this is something that will be greater than anything we have even experienced today. But that's not all. As the apostasy comes first, and then it says the man of lawlessness is revealed. And the man of lawlessness will commit the abomination of desolation. Why? Because he will erect himself, exalt himself above every God, and he will take his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And this has happened in part as many times in Bible prophecy, there are historical fulfillments, but there is also a future fulfillment. And this abomination, this idea of a man going into the temple and setting himself up as God and desecrating that holy place has historical fulfillment. In fact, even before Paul wrote these words, even before Jesus said there would be an abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, this had already happened in 167 BC. A general named Antiochus Epiphanes. Who knows what an epiphany is? 
a manifestation or a vision or a revelation of God. And so this man named himself the revelation, the manifestation of God. Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 sets up an image of Zeus in the temple of Yahweh and he sacrificed a pig upon the altar. This was an abomination to the people because the nation of Israel is to have no God but Yahweh and they're never to have images or idols and the pig being declared by the law an unclean animal was wholly unfit for the worship of a thrice holy God. Can you imagine a greater desecration, a greater abomination for the nation of Israel than to have this man who declares himself to be a very manifestation of God to go into the holy temple and set up an idol to Zeus and then sacrifice a pig upon the altar of the Lord God Almighty. This happened in 70 AD again. The temple is destroyed and desecrated in like manner as to what Antiochus did. But this also has a future fulfillment. The soon to be revealed man of lawlessness or antichrist will exalt himself, take his seat in the temple, displaying himself as God. And friends, Christ cannot return. We're talking about the return of Christ, the physical return of Christ to this earth until after the apostasy and after the revelation of the antichrist, the man of lawlessness, and that he commits the abomination of desolation. As Christ was first in mystery, this is, uh, Fawcett says, as Christ was first in mystery and afterwards revealed, so the Antichrist is first in mystery and afterwards shall be developed and revealed. As righteousness found its embodiment in Christ, the Lord of righteousness, so sin shall have its embodiment in the man of sin. Jesus was the incarnation of God and this man of lawlessness will be the very incarnation of evil. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 is where we get the term, the title, Antichrist. 1 John 2, 18, the apostle John, the same one who had the revelation, incidentally, said, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming. How many have been hearing that Antichrist is? I've heard that since I was a boy. Well, guess what? John, been, they've been hearing that since the first century. John said, you heard that Antichrist is coming. He says, but I got news for you. He's not coming He's already here. Even now, many antichrists have appeared. From this, we know that it is the last hour. And friends, I think that it is no coincidence. We're talking, of course, the spirit of antichrist, the man of lawlessness. There's a term that has, you're hearing it more and more often now. How many have heard the term anarchy? That's, that's a term that really was not a part of our experience. That would be something that was uh, just absolutely foreign to what, would, what you would think would ever happen. But do you realize now there's a growing number of people who support anarchy? You know what anarchy is? Lawlessness, the spirit of lawlessness, the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of, of anarchy that is in our world today. And this is what Jesus, this is what the Bible says was going to happen. And by this, you will know that it is the last hour. And so the spirit of Antichrist is already here and has been here for 2,000 years, but he has not yet been revealed. And he says here, there have been many antichrists. And probably if we were to look throughout history, we could find many who were so evil, who were so wicked, who were so cruel that they would absolutely uh, serve as people that we could say they were animated, they were possessed by the spirit of antichrist. And there's been many, and there are many today. First, uh, the, but the Bible says that this this, though it's here, and it's been here for 2,000 years, it cannot yet be revealed until this happens. First Thess 2 Thessalonians 2 reveals that the man of lawlessness cannot be revealed, I love this, until the restrainer is taken out of the way. You know, he said to the, disciple, to the Thessalonians, what restrains him, so that in his time he will be revealed. 
For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Some Bible scholars actually believe that the identity of the restrainer, he who now restrains, was the Roman Empire. There's some problems here. There's some problems here because the Roman Empire has ceased to exist. And if the Roman Empire was the restrainer, then the Antichrist should have been revealed. But he has not yet been revealed, meaning that the restrainer is still in place. The restrainer has not yet been removed. They may have, that may have been a partial historical fulfillment, but the future and ultimate fulfillment of the end time restrainer of evil is not the Roman Empire. It is the spirit of the living God that has taken up residence inside redeemed humanity, otherwise known as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, we're talking about our identity and our role in these last days. What is our identity? The church is the great restrainer. And what is our role? To hold back the darkness, to hold back the lawlessness, to restrain the spirit of darkness and hell, to hold it back until the church be removed. I I liken us unto a great big dam that is holding back the waters. But eventually God's going to lift that dam out of its place And that judgment is going to flow upon the land because right now, as much as the world hates us, and they do, as much as there are people out in the world who think that the world would be better without a church, and they're out there, as much as some people say, well, if the Christians are going to die and go to heaven, I wish they'd go ahead and get over with and go because we'd have a lot more fun without them. Yet they don't know that the church is holding back the darkness. That the church that is so despised by a wicked, evil world is the only thing that stands between them and the full onslaught of the wrath and the fury and the judgment of Almighty Holy God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The church is that great restraint of the power of the Holy Spirit. Clearly, uh, Bible commentator, commentator Uart said clearly this day of grace in which the spirit is at work the gospel is proclaimed and the church of Jesus Christ is being completed will someday come to an end merciful God restrains the sinister powers who seek to destroy his work during the interim between Christ's first and second advents however When the last day comes, this restraint will disappear and the lawless one will be seen for what he is. Just as long as there is light, the darkness is held back. As long as the salt prevents the putrefaction, so the church filled with the power of the Holy Spirit is the restraining force on earth today. William Barclay makes these observations of the passage that we have uh, addressed. He said, number one, there's a force of evil in the world. Even if they could not logically prove that there was a devil, many people would say, I know there is because I've met him. We hide our heads in the sand if we deny that there is an evil power at work among us. God is in control. Things may seem to be crashing to chaos, but in some strange way, even the chaos is under God's control. I liken it unto when God, uh, the, the devil came to God and accused Job. He said, Job only serves you because you're good to him. He said, let me torment him and then see if he kill, curse you and die. Remember God said, you can, go th- you can go that far. And God set the boundary for how far the devil could go. Well, let me tell you something. The world seems to be just spinning chaotically out of control. But let me tell you something. God has set the boundary. God has marked a line. God still has the reins of power on planet earth. And the enemy is still restrained by the Holy Spirit at work in the church today. William Barclay concludes with this final observation, the ultimate triumph of God is certain. 
In the end, nothing can stand against him. The lawless one may have his day, but there comes a time when God says, thus far and no further. And so the great question is, on what side are you? In the struggle at the heart of the universe, are you for God or for Satan? Stand with me today. How shall we live in these last days? How shall we live in these last days? Paul wrote these words because he was concerned that some had upset, some had filled with fear, some had robbed the hope of the believers at Thessalonica. And he said to them, be not disturbed and be not deceived. And I would say to you today, how shall we live in these last days as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Be not disturbed and be not deceived. Friends, we are on the winning side. I said we are on the winning side. You may have to put your faith glasses on to see it, but we are on the winning side. The church is a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. You may have to put your faith glasses on to see it because in the natural it may not appear to be thus and so. But friends, we are a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. The Lord has promised that he will preserve his people. This was Paul's concern that they were being scared that false teachers and false teachings were deceiving them. Paul tells us how we are to live in light of the coming of the Lord. We are very curious about the when of the coming of the Lord. But the Bible doesn't give us the when. But let me tell you what the Bible does give us. The Bible tells us how we ought to live in anticipation for the coming of the Lord. Whether it be today or whether it be in 10 years, the Bible gives us the instruction we need to know how to live so that we will be ready when Jesus calls to gather his, that great roundup when he's going to gather all of his people from the four corners of planet earth. I can't wait for that day. Do not be quickly shaken of your composure or disturbed. Jesus said something similar unto his disciples in reference to his going and in reference to his coming back. He said in John 14, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then he said this, I go to prepare a place for you. Hallelujah. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Why? Because I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself, gather you up unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also the man of lawlessness after the church, the restrainer is removed, will be revealed, but he will be revealed for his own destruction at the revelation of Jesus in his second coming, which is described in Revelation chapter 19. It says that he is coming on a white horse and he's not coming alone. He is coming with a great multitude. He is coming with a great army. And friend, this is not an angelic army. This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the ones that he gathered together unto himself. And when he comes back, he's coming back with us. We're going to be right there with him. The Bible says from out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword and with it he strikes down the nations. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Bible tells us that that Antichrist will be seized. And he who deceived will be thrown into the lake of fire and destroyed by the splendor of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is the identity of the church in these last days? Defeated, deflated, depleted? Or is the church full of the power of the Holy Spirit, the greatest force on planet Earth, holding back, restraining the power of darkness, saying to Satan, this far and no more. Could it be that God placed in his sovereign wisdom this church right here, 11,000 East Northwest Highway, because it is a dark world around us? And he wanted this church to be like a city on a hill. He wanted this church in the darkness of Dallas to shine bright and drive back and push back the darkness 
that he wanted you and me, wherever we go, to be the salt that prevents the rot, the putrefaction, the further decay of this world. That's power. And you're right. The devil and his crowd would like to see the church go because the church is the one holding him back right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we're a part of something glorious. We're a part of something wonderful. That God, that many have turned their backs on the church, but you have not turned your back on the church. And in the last days, there will be a great falling away. And many will walk away, but Lord, you will not walk away from your church. You have a specific role for us to play. And that is to be the restrainer through the power of the Holy Spirit, to be the restrainer of lawlessness, of the spirit of darkness, of the spirit of Antichrist. Lord, I pray today that we will put on our faith glasses and be able to see beyond what we can see in the natural. And Lord, we'll be encouraged and our faith will be stirred up to, to know that we are an overcoming, victorious people. And Lord God, you're not coming for a church that's down in the dumps, defeated and busted and broke and powerless, anemic. You're coming back for a church resplendent with the glory of God that is giving the devil a headache every day. God, use us for your glory. Use this church and use us individually as salt and light in our world around us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, amen.